Well, at least we have an audience tonight. We are recording. For a live audience. Holly! She's back. Very attentive. Yeah, she's snoring over there. So we are number... 24. 24. Well, everybody, are we ready, Morgan? Yeah. Well, welcome back to uh, another episode of Father Knows Something. We It's Morgan, Justin, and Jerry slash dad. And uh, we are on episode 24. Call it the dynamic trio. <laughs> Rewrite the phrase. <laughs> Okay, well, we're back after what's probably felt like World War III for all of us, but I think the perks of us, or I don't know if it's a perk, but the reality is we're very genuine people, and we're just like you guys. Life is not perfect for us. We fight. We battle. And so we took the week off last week to regroup and just get back into a better headspace. So when you uh, find out that sometimes your parents and yourselves, young adults, don't always see eye to eye or parents don't see eye to eye with you, we can all take lessons to, again, communicate. It helps. (laughs) Sometimes you have to communicate and run. (laughs) Yeah. We're still working it out. You'll, it'll be fine. But life is full of bumps in the road and we don't always see eye to eye to eye with the people in our lives. And so. But the one thing that we do have is we do love each other. And that is the most important thing. This is true. So let's jump in. 24. Okay. I'm so so jealous of your mics. Why? Because I was because, just... because, because we are hands free and he's got a I can't get this, this figured out. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you're just like both just sit there and you're just We're both casual, like, we're relaxed. And, and I'm just like <laughs> Well sit back until you have to talk. I just Yeah. Okay. I'm done. So we have an update. This update is from episode 21. It was story five. Happened around the 38 minute mark. So this is the story about The woman, she wrote in, um, her and her husband both have chronic health conditions. And Mm -hmm. we talked about the spoon theory and um, how their mother-in-law was super nice and was actually paying for a cleaning woman to come in. Yes, yes. Mrs. Terry. So Mrs. Terry went to the mother-in-law and said, I want to be done cleaning for them. Like, this is too much, blah, 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 blah. Like, just, there was, we were very confused. We were like, is it the mother-in-law? Is it Mrs. Terry? We thought Mrs. Terry was kind of pulling a bait and switch maybe. And so- We have an update. First, I want to say thank you for taking the time to read and give advice on my problems with Mrs. Terry. Second, I would like to add in more information on my mother-in-law and say that she too also has MS. She does everything she can to help us as she knows how it is. And she did not know Mrs. Terry before this, but heard about her from my sister-in-law who does know her. Now for the update. I have recently been released from the hospital after having a major flare-up. I pushed myself too hard. During that time, my husband took both my mother-in-law aside and Mrs. Terry aside. She does have both of our numbers, by the way, and they all talked separately. My husband went into super protective mode because out of the two of us, I'm the sickest. We discovered that my mother-in-law pays her more than her normal rates for houses similar to ours. Not too crazy, much more, but more. I would say it is anywhere from $50 to $70 more. My husband quickly figured out that the reason why Mrs. Terry was complaining, there was a week where he was out of town dealing with a death in the family, so I was home all alone, taking care of everything on my own and working as much as I could before going home to pick up my child and cook and then working some more from home to not lose out on hours as I am hourly. We, me and the child, stayed home as we felt it was not appropriate for her to be at the funeral of his grandfather, someone she barely knew. For my mother-in-law, she was just being nosy and trying to check in and make sure that everything is going okay. My husband told his mom that it is okay to ask, but to ask us. He then told Mrs. Terry that if she has any issues to talk to us about it, we can't fix anything if we don't know about it, and that we are sorry that she felt that way. So as of right now, My mother-in-law is keeping her nose out of it and has apologized to me when hubby told her that this was the reason why I ended up in the hospital and how she didn't mean to cause trouble. 
I do not know if Mrs. Terry has apologized or anything as she doesn't talk to me, but she has been talking to my husband. We are giving her another chance, so I hope it goes well. Thanks for the update. Yeah, that's like honestly ideal. Like they're giving her a shot now. They know like Mrs. Terry was the problem. It wasn't the mother-in-law. You know, maybe the mother-in-law overstepped a boundary by asking Mrs. Terry, but also the mother-in-law is the one paying her. But I, I'm still, the, the issue that I have is this woman still works for a couple and she won't communicate with the woman of the home. And that yeah. to me is still an issue. I'm unless I mean, but that's an issue with me. It may, it may not be an issue with her. Yeah, and I'm going to be honest. I think because of her health, and like she said, she is the sicker of the two of them. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is a task that she can delegate. Her husband is like you're responsible for Mrs. Terry communication. I'm just saying, like I think it is okay to <laughs> to delegate. Imagine the task. that every time. Yeah. So I think uh, my thought on this one is uh, Mrs. Terry should. Uh, yeah, that'd be funny. That's what they do on radio. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Moving along. We're very happy for you, though. And look out for yourself because clearly we're overdoing it and you need to put yourself first so then you can be there to help others like your little kiddo. Yeah. Okay. Up first on the write-ins this week. Hi, Jerry. Thank you so much for starting this podcast. It's been great to hear, and it's so nice to have an awesome father figure like yourself to go to for advice. I don't have the greatest relationship with my own father, and no, he wouldn't be any good to talk to about this. I, 32 female, have been having a hard time with dating. I've never been married. I don't have kids. I have a pretty great career, and honestly, I'm very pretty. I used to have a lot of issues with self-esteem in my 20s, so it's taken a lot of therapy for me to actually love myself and who I am, so I'm not willing to change for anyone. I haven't really dated much in the past few years because I decided to focus on my master's program, self, career, and well, COVID happened. I tried dating recently and met what I thought was a great guy. I was able to be myself around him and didn't feel the pressure to have to talk to him 24-7 in order to make things work. We were together for a month and he broke up with me. We broke up because he decided to move to another state to take care of a parent. I tried to see if we could make it work long distance, but was shut down and have not really spoken to him since. Recently, I tried to start dating again, and honestly, it's been very difficult. I haven't been able to feel like I can be myself in some of these conversations I've started with other guys. But also, my worst fear of dating has returned again. I am frequently asked, what's wrong with me? Or, what did I do to make those guys run away? There are also other comments that are made about me because I've never been engaged and have been single for so many years. It's quite disheartening and frankly, really tough to feel okay with dating. I've had a few guys tell me that I'm very intimidating and that I'm, quote, just too good for them. I've also had others tell me that I'm wife material, yet I'm still in the same spiral of not being able to find a connection in any way, even if it was casual. I've been told that I'm too good for them to be a friends with benefit. I know that in time I'll find someone but even trying to date and put myself out there is tough. I can't even get some dating practice in because I can't even make it to a first date. I've explored this with my therapist in the past and just felt like they never understood fully how to help me. So here I am seeing what a father would recommend to someone like me. Um, the only thing, the first thing that comes to mind is you're not going to push this. I mean, you, you definitely, you know, need to put yourself in areas where you can meet people and become and make friends to go out with a guy with the intention to say, hey, I'm really looking for you to be my boyfriend, is putting the pressure on you to go to step two before you even figure out step one. Step one is to find someone that you can be with and just enjoy as a friend, do things with. Go find out if you laugh, find out in the evening, if you, if you decide you like spending more time together in the evenings, that you can keep yourselves mentally occupied and comfortable that you can be yourself putting pressure on to, you know, for that, to, to make that person quote dating material might just be too much pressure from the very beginning. I know that I've never been married. I'm 64 years old or, and that I do find out that when I would, you know, go, when I get into the dating mode, I would go on 
every every website that was out there. And plus meeting people in any possible way because I am outgoing. So I would meet somebody in a restaurant or a market or wherever I met them. But I did a lot of coffee. I did a lot of just, forget a coffee, I even did walks. So let's meet for a walk. Just to see if there was some kind of connection. And I didn't go through two people. I may have gone through 30 or 40 or 50 people consistently just just to go do the walk or just to have a cup of coffee, just to whatever it might be, just to to see where those those connections are. And once you even find that connection, there's no guarantee that after through two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight months, that you're gonna know if that's the person. What does happen is that I call it the shit screen. The 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 failures that you had uh, experienced in the past or the, a, a personality trait in the past that comes up and hits your filter right off the bat, you can quick, you can more rapidly dismiss that potential person for a, a deeper relationship automatically and go on to the next. Because you really are going from one to the next to the next to the next in the very be- within those first meetings to see if there's someone you really want to hang with. And then once you figure out you want to hang with them, then take it just take it day by day and just see how you guys grow and if you know that being transparent with them of who you are will really help. So don't don't be anything but but yourself. Don't try to impress them. Don't try to do anything that's going to catch someone's attention other than being you because the guy that's for you is going to recognize you right off the bat when you are that real person and then it's you're 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 on a path of with everything going to where it ends up in the right um orbit for lack of a better word and that's my thoughts were you mostly on apps and websites when you I've, I, I went to a period uh, a few years ago and I, it was a New Year's Eve. And I said, I'm done with this. I'm going to really meet somebody. And I went on every single website from the conservatives to the ones that are way out there and the adult sites and, and had some really interesting uh you know, write backs or calls or yeah. you know letters. It it certainly set the stage for me to recognize that the more honest and direct you are what you're looking for in these sites, there are people that will fit every shoe. Yeah. And evidently I didn't fit her shoe, but you know, she was very direct on what she wanted in her life. She knew what it was and she looked at the answers and she said, Hey, these are someone that I'd want to want to go out with. So I really realized I, and, and, and I used, the, I changed my, uh, my profile to say that for, you know, everyone has their kink and I didn't mean it to be so much sexual as much as it's whatever it is that makes them uh, excited about being with somebody or their yeah. time. And it maybe it is part of their sexuality, whatever that would be. And the more that you're open about, who you are and what you are and what you like in life in every aspect, it gives that person that ability of saying, you know something, we are really able to be open with one another. We don't have to have secrets and it's going to work out and be better until and then, then you can finally get to the part where if you do decide to be intimate, you can freely and you can see what happens with your life. But you, it's nice to have that foundation. Yeah. And that takes, just takes time. It just doesn't happen, you know, one, two, three. I wish it did. Well, and I think there is something to the cliche that it can happen maybe a little more when you're not so heavily searching for it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I certainly, I don't think I was searching to find someone to date when I met Morgan. Mm-hmm. But it just completely like, you know, changed everything. Yeah. And I mean, we met on Hinge. And so I'm I'm picking up on like, she says here, I can't even get some dating practice in because I can't even make it to the first date. Um, I know that in time I'll find someone, but even trying to date and put myself out there is tough. So I think I'm picking up that it's just like kind of 
even getting in the position to secure a date is difficult. So I think kind of what you said makes sense once she like starts dating and like really getting in there. Mm -hmm. But I get where she's coming from where it's like to even start dating is a challenge because I mean, I was on Hinge and whatever for months and I went on a total of two dates. One, I went to the bar. He ghosted me, never showed up. Second one was Justin. And let me tell you, I canceled on Justin three times before I finally went out on a date with him. Two or three. It was, I was a little flaky yeah. at first. And I like, I didn't really know what to expect. Like I wasn't really going in with anything like, oh, I want a date. I was just kind of like, I got nothing to lose. Cause like the one I tried to go on a date with like ghosted me, like didn't even show up after right. I went to the bar and like literally sat there for 30 minutes by myself. So I just kind of like went in with no expectations, which I think might help. Like you can go on Hinge and just start like, dipping your feet in the water, seeing what's out there, seeing if you connect with someone and then go into it without any expectations. Cause then it's like, it's not so much so that first date pressure where it's like all on you to perform or make a good impression or whatever. Like just be yourself. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't like you and if people say um, things like what's wrong with you or what did you do to make those other guys run away? It's fuck them. Yeah, what's that about? <laughs> That's fucking weird. That is weird. So literally find some excuse like, oh, my boss just called. I have to go. Like, I don't know. Like, run. Because anyone that's going to ask you that, especially on a first date or they're not the even on a dating app, and that's the pre-conversation, they're weirdos. Yeah. They're absolute weirdos. You know, another thought is, I don't know if there are certain things that you enjoy to do or hobbies that you thought about doing that you've never done. You may have decided one day, gee, I've never done martial arts. I'd like to try that. Or I'd like to take up ballroom dancing or salsa dancing. And when you find yourself going in to, to take a, you know, two nights a week or one night a week to go do whatever that hobby is going to be to go, you know, have yourself, you know, grow you will meet people there. And it, that's a great way of meeting people without the pressure of meeting someone. So you go there and the, you know, you need a dance partner. There's always an, you know, somebody that's a dance partner or, or will be coming in as another single. And you can certainly meet people that way. It's, these are the things that, ha that you meet someone that has an interest similar to you, which you automatically start with. And then you can go enjoy each other that way and, and if it's if you find a friend that's just a friend, I, chances are they might know somebody that will be able to say, "I've met this person. She is wonderful. She's amazing, and I'd like to really introduce you to her." Because when you find when people meet special people that may not be their mate, they really do want to. You know, it's in their nature to want to really find someone that who is another friend of theirs that it might might work for you guys. Yeah, and so in the anything else we should know, she does mention um, that she is a social worker with an engineering and zoology background. Yes, I'm all over the place in education. I don't have kids, and I'm not really sure if I will have any due to a reproductive issue. Um, and I'm okay with not having kids. I have two dogs that I dedicate a lot of time to because I train them, and I'm working on integrating them into my work. One of my dogs is a certified therapy dog. So... And I'm a Latina. I'm overzealous about life. So, yeah, I think there's like a bunch of things like go to a dog class, like a dog training course, go to a dog agility course, like go to the dance stuff. I go think to the dog park. Well, there's singles events zoology too. Zoology group. Like, yes. Yeah, Remember dating? those that used to be on uh, KDWB, KDWB back in Minnesota? Yeah. You'd hear about like the singles uh, trips and, yeah. and things being advertised. I don't know how... I'm sure it's still a thing now that it's COVID's definitely, kind of yeah. uh, trailing off. But that's why I asked you, did you mainly use like apps and websites? Because but he, that's what popped in my head. He as, was desperate on the apps though. Like I think like you felt like you weren't connecting with people on the apps and you were like, this isn't me. Like I need to meet people in person. Like mm -hmm. I'm very much so like a people person. I do better in person versus mm -hmm. on the app and whatever. So I think you were kind of at your wits end with the apps too. And so we were looking into like speed dating rounds for yeah. for him. But like, I think COVID just happened and then he ended up meeting Co his girlfriend. COVID is definitely a uh, a, a real deterrent in this whole thing. Yeah. I mean, I, there are so many people I have talked to that have said, I, I settled and, and just stayed with one person, even though they weren't my person. 
because it was someone to, to be with during COVID. Right. And mm -hmm. I've heard this many times from different people. But I will say one thing, you need to, to find ways of being out and about because locked in your house are not going to find you. You got to be out and about. Yep. Yep. Even if you, I don't know if you like to bike ride, you know, start a pattern. I mean, so if someone does, if someone sees you riding that bike, if you like bike riding through, through the park or on a certain path, if you stay with a certain thing and someone sees you, they might even, you know, start planning themselves to meet you. Oh, you, you never know. I mean, I'm serious. I'll I mean, I know, actually, I know, I know we're moving on to the next one, but I actually did that in New York. I knew that there was this girl that worked the hostess um, shift because Jake and I always did Sunday night burritos, mm -hmm. always in mm -hmm. New York. It was like six blocks from our apartment. And we walk every Sunday night and go there. And there was always this girl at the front. And so I got all hyped up one day and I'm like, I was talking to Jake about it. You know, it's like I was 21 or something. <laughs> so it's almost like you're that teenage boy, like excited to talk to a girl for the first time. It works the same when you're 60 years I know. old too. It doesn't change. <laughs> so I the the third or fourth time or whatever we went in there, she walked us to our table and I started like a mini conversation with her. And then on the way out, the whole dinner, I was getting all nervous. On the way out, I stopped and I said, hey, blah, 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 blah. And I got her number and like the whole thing. And I was really excited. I never saw her again after that, but mm -hmm. it was just like, <laughs> That's what you I still tried. Yeah. No, but that's like, it, you it, know what I mean? It, it works. I've done it. it <laughs> <laughs> I'm guilty of it. It has, I, it's worked both ways. Just you, like in a non creepy way. It's in a non creepy way. I've had yeah. a woman come up to me. She's, I've seen you here, you know, you know, you know, a, you know every Tuesday. I just, you know, and, and, and it wasn't really to go meet, you know, with the, the intention of anything other than just getting to say hello and knowing and seeing if there's anything. So you can explore that yeah. without any implication. So like I said, staying in your house isn't going to help you. You got to get out and enjoy life. And when you find yourself enjoying life out there, that vibe is going to get picked up. Okay. By the way, I'm wearing my capital in my, because it's midterms. Oh. You got to do the yoga. I can't do this. This is it. But too bad. Oh, they oh, can yeah, see there it. You go. Oh, they yeah. can see it. A little bit, a little bit. Okay. Midterms are coming up, guys. <laughs> yeah okay moving along hi jerry justin and morgan i've been listening to two hot takes since it first came out so it was obvious i needed to listen to this one as well but on to the issue i 22 female lost my dad in late 2015 just before i turned 16 my father and i were super close i was the baby in the family and spent the most amount of time with him throughout my life that being said my mother and I have never been very close, and ever since my dad passed away, we still don't see eye to eye. So currently, myself and my significant other, 27 male, live with her. We pay rent and pay for groceries and other things. I currently work in the banking industry and have been since I turned 18. That being said, last year I received a promotion, and since then, I've gotten three raises and gained a lot more income. And since that happened, my mother has been expecting a lot more from me in a monetary way. She has been bringing up things from when I was a little bit younger that I owe her for this and that and the other thing and has been holding things over my head that she has previously said she would pay for with no mention of paying her back. We also, we also recently finished a remodel on her home, specifically on the room we currently live in, we made it a lot larger and added a walk-in closet, etc. My significant other and myself paid for the majority of the remodel, and my mother agreed to cover the part. And my mother agreed to cover part of it as we have already paid well over $3,000 towards it, and she only had to cover about 800. But she found out that I got another raise and she is now expecting me to cover all of it. I just don't know what to do. I feel like I'm responsible for it, even though she agreed to cover it, but I do still have bills to pay, and her all of a sudden expecting me to cover this is putting me in a very tough position. But I don't want to cause an argument about it. Well, the one thing that it did do, it added value to her home. That you, the writer, are probably not going to ever see. Right. 
That's correct. It added equity to the value of her home. Mm-hmm. That 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 it's her equity, and unless she stipulated something in the very beginning, you know, it, I don't know how she. You, I think it's a conversation you need to have with her and say, look, you know, I I want to be fair. I don't want to have a pissy match over money with you, mom. You know, and I appreciate that you we we've been able to, you know, do what we're doing, and where we are. And if you want me to move, you know, maybe that's time that we do this. But we want to be here with you. It works out well. And the fact that I'm making more money, it, it gives me the opportunity that we can put some away so we can have a future and we can move out and we can do this stuff. And I, I would think you would want that. So I think it's just a conversation you'd have to have. You know, I don't know where her anger is coming from and what her what her pressures are and her frustrations, you have a clearer view of what her financial stresses are than we do. But typically, you have to work together as a family to 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 work through whatever you're trying to do to achieve the goal. But I, I I don't think because you're making more money that all of a sudden she should say, "Gee, now that you're making more money, you need to uh, start coughing up stuff from you know from twenty years ago." Yeah, um, that's. Because that 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 money is that was done under a different uh, purpose and a different um, you know deal. That was an experience that was going on back then. It doesn't doesn't carry forward. So I think that's as simple as it is. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a that, conversation. That's, that's our that's our that's my opinion at least. And with the money and the raises and the job, you, I mean, you're probably going to get to a point where you can move out. Yeah, if that's I mean, the solution. But, but but you also want to have some money that you can move out. You right. want to save that money as much as you can. Yeah. So there is a little bit more info. My mother and I had a very tough relationship over the years and have gotten into many arguments about various things. We got into one particularly bad argument shortly after my dad passed. I was about 16 at the time, and she yelled at me and said, quote, I know that you would have preferred that I would have died instead of your dad, but here I am. Also, the only reason my significant other and I live with her is because she has had a lot of medical issues over the last three years and hasn't been able to take care of everything around the house. In late 2021, she got surgery and was not medically allowed to be by herself. Well, that's something that is that should be brought up as well. And not not to not to throw this isn't a you know a Michael Franks, you know, song that you, you know, you throw your bananas at her and she throws them back at you. This is really a thing that you guys have to really say, look, this is, we are here in the situation for the following reasons. And if you don't want me here, I mean, if you want to go pay someone to be here to take care of you because you need it, trust me, mom, it's going to be a lot more and they're not going to participate in paying the bills and give you the attention. And far as you telling me that you wish dead, you know, I, I died rather than dead, that's something that maybe you feel. It's not what I feel. I can't help you with your insecurity, but I'd like to have a I'd, I'd like to have a better relationship where we don't have to fight. Yeah, that's just a. I this don't is, know. That's a crazy. This is statement. just negativity, and it's not healthy for either one of us. So take take the upper hand. Take the take the parental uh, plan at this point in time, and, and and nail her on it by just saying, "Let's take a high road." Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's my feeling. You got any other thoughts to this? No, I think I think you both said it well. Okay. My first thought was, I think it's time to move out, but I think there's a lot of clearly extenuating circumstances. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I think I think have a conversation and just say, you know, I think the equity is a big part. Like I'm putting a lot of money in with, and I won't get anything out if you did choose to sell. So. I think it is fair that you contribute a little. I want to build a better relationship and everything you guys said. And you can even, and, and she can even say to her mom, and we, you know, we did pay this equity and we're giving it to you. We're not asking to give it back to us. It's yeah. yours. They're just trying to make their life more comfortable while they live there. Yeah. Yeah. So very tough, tough situation. It's tough being a caregiver and in, in this role. Okay. Up next My mom passed away this week after a long time of being sick. My father passed away almost 10 years ago as well. I feel totally alone. 
My siblings are much older than I am and have spouses, children, and many friends to support them. I barely have friends, and no one really understands what I'm feeling. Even my siblings don't understand because they have a different father than I do. Please advise me on how to navigate this lonely world as a 22-year-old girl. You have just discovered you're an orphan. And I know what that is because everyone that loses the second parent, after losing the first parent prior, go through this void. It's, it's not uncommon. And the sad thing is that you're just, even in the best of scenarios, it's difficult that you still feel all alone. Um, what happens when the second parent, at least in my experience, goes, you find out that the houses split because you're, you're, it, when your dad went, he was the patriarch in, in the family. Dad went first, mom went, who went first? Dad passed 10 years ago. So However, now the mom passed. The siblings all have different fathers. Right, so but, their fathers are still alive. But the mother, alive. the mother just passed. Yeah. So, so the, the matriarch who was left passed and she was a common denominator between all of you. She was still, she was still the head of the castle. Now the castle is split. Now there's new, everyone has their own kingdom. You're going to have your own kingdom between your family, which right now is non-existent because you're not, you're not married. You don't have any children. Doesn't sound like, and you know they have their thing. It 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 will take time. Not this is a week that your mom just passed, so this is going to take time that you guys are going to have to fill yourselves to go fill that void to hold that glue together, and this is this is tough. This is exactly what happens. And if you ever uh, have seen a lizard lose its tail, the tail will still wiggle and the lizard is not even around. And that is you right now. You are a wag, all of you, you're all wagging tails with no nerves connected. You have been severed. So you, it just takes some time for this healing to go on. So if, I hope that you can communicate with your siblings and try to hold each other up because you're all going through your own sense of loss with your mom. Now, they may still have their biological fathers. They may may or may not. But it is still, when you lose a second parent like you just did, again, it is a disconnect. The nerves are literally cut and you don't, and you have these phantom pains and these phantom things are going on. And friends are good. It it it. I I had to find a place to go. I actually end up going to do services. It was a tradition in Judaism to say a prayer for a, every day for a year. And I don't know how it helped because I don't I don't speak Hebrew or anything. But just going and being part of that com camaraderie, it helped. My siblings were busy, you know, dealing with other things. You know, you know. You know, everyone is dealing with mom's sofa, mom's table, mom's this, mom's that. And no matter what goes on, everyone gets in cat fights. I, I would love to see a law for families that lose their that are gonna lose their parents, that everything gets locked up for a year and come back in a year and we'll go figure it out because you're a lot healthier in your mind at that time. So all that said, I hope you can take pull the things out of my the, these thoughts and apply them to yourselves, uh, yourself and how you can muscle some of this, but you will find, you will find a place where you can go that you will feel better and you can reflect and take the time, listen in your head to the voice of your mom as she speaks to you, even your dad as he speaks to you. And what you might think is just your subconscious talking, take, take it for the fact that it might be them. Yeah. And it's tough. Uh, I'm sure there's grief counseling and some other things you can certainly pick up and go to. That was my grief counseling, was going to those prayer services once a day for 10 minutes. Yeah. And I don't, I, 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 there was a, a, a different conversation, but I'll get to the punchline. I don't know how, uh, how antibiotics help my, my, my body to feel better. I don't know how they work, but, 
and I don't know how going to those services help help me to make it work. But the medicine uh, certainly heals your physical body, and that happened to heal my spiritual soul. That's cool. Yeah, I think for this story and the previous story, sorry for your loss. I mean, no yeah. matter when it happens, it's you know, it's tough. So I I obviously cannot imagine this feeling or just mentally, physically, what this is even close to being like. I, don't, I have no clue. But I think kind of what's popping to my head is a little bit when when people go through something that's tough, I think it's important to kind of latch onto those little things that make you happy. Mm-hmm. And I've always been, I've always been one of those people that all the little things make me happy. Like the, I feel like the, you know what I'm talking about? I don't know if it's a cliche, but it's like, I'm always have loved just the littlest things that happen in the day. Like sometimes sitting in the studio with a window, a hummingbird will come and like land on the ledge. And then I'll just be so excited about it. And it like makes my day. So I think finding maybe little, little things that make you happy or, or falling deeper into your passions Mm -hmm. and just doing those types of things. And then when you're ready, I think similar to the other story we read, putting yourself out there and just connecting with new people. I think new connections with people, uh, like it happens to me all the time in the studio, all the new people you meet and just the, you never know where awesome friendships and relationships Mm -hmm. can come from. And I think that can be very powerful when going through such loss. I agree. But uh, I, I, I also, again, will say that as you go through the day and you, get a feeling about them. Don't be afraid to listen in your head and don't be afraid to cry. Crying is a healing thing as you miss them. And the more that you keep them in your heart and you think about them and you're able to make them a part of your day and laugh about it. And if you see something going on say, mom, what do you think of that? Or what do you guys think of that? And then kind of listen to what they might say. And (laughs) you'll find yourself laughing about it because I'm sure your mom made you laugh. And Take those funny those funny thoughts and that will it, it kind of honors their memory. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and I would I would say loneliness I can imagine is a big part of this. And like they mentioned, they're really lonely. And I would try as difficult as it might be to connect with others. Connection is such an important thing and honestly it can really help your healing journey. So Um, If there's other local groups, grief groups, or you can find, you know, similar peers that have gone through this. Like, I know there's a girl I follow on TikTok and have worked with in the past. She just hashtagged like dead moms club. And it's a big hashtag for people that have lost their moms to connect and find each other. And so I would just try to get as connected as you can. And it's probably going to feel like pulling teeth because it is hard to put yourself out there on a regular basis and try to connect with people. But if you can do it because it will really help. Okay. Yeah. Our, our condolences. And I know what you're going through. I, I remember it very well, Yeah, but it does get better and it does heal and you'll fill that hole over a period of time. Fill in. Mm-hmm. Recently, I stopped talking to my two closest cousins and I don't know who's at fault. My two cousins and I have been super close since birth. We're all 21 so we literally grew up at the same time. I always felt like the outsider though, since they both are first cousins and I'm a second cousin with them. Recently, I got engaged and moved out with my fiance. We got our first home. They often told me they were happy that I had what they always wanted. It made me kind of happy, but at the same time, it's a weird comment to make. They began going out without me and would get mad when I couldn't join because of work. They'd tell me to call out, And I would always say, it's okay, go without me. Our problems began when I told them one day I couldn't join them due to work, but that we could grab coffee on the weekend. Neither replied to me, and they were posting each other at lunch. It made me feel upset that they would always complain about me not being able to go. So I texted them basically saying, how are you guys upset? I can never make it. But when I try to plan something, you don't reply. They got upset, and we just didn't talk after. They started hanging out even more without bothering to invite me. They started telling the family that I was jealous they'd hang out without me. They also told the family 
that I think I'm better than them since I have my life together and how they reached out to say happy birthday, but that I didn't reply when that wasn't even true. They also ranted on social media saying, quote, it's never their loss. And now it's been seven months and we still don't talk. And we see each other often at family events. Do you think I'm at fault? Should I even bother to be close to people like that? Well, they definitely have something going on. They're jealous. And it could be jealousy. They can just say, you know, she's just, you know, she's got her husband now or she's got her guy and, you know, she doesn't need us anymore. We're going to go out and continue to go to do the uh, the evening scene because she, she's not going to be any fun. So I really don't, I mean, there's obviously something clearly going on that it's too bad you can't, uh, sit down with them, identify, because you're not just friends, you are family, mm -hmm. you know? And I have cousins that are not just my first cousins. I got seconds and thirds and, you know, I go all the way down. In fact, I'm leaving next week to go to go to, to an event with cousins that are third cousins back East. We are, that we are close like we are siblings. And it sounds like you guys were close like you were siblings for all these years. Mm -hmm. You just need to sit them down and say, you're not going anywhere until we figure this out, you know, and say, I really want to get this worked out. If I did something, tell me what it is. Because right now this behavior is not going to work. We are family and it's different than with a friend. You can get a little more identifying with this. Mm -hmm. And I think they'll see the fact that you really do care. And you can say, I care. I want to fix whatever's going on. And if I said something that, that either I said out of stupidity or you misunderstood what I was saying, let's fix it because that's what we need to do right now. And you can do that. You, you're in that position because they're family. Yeah. And I, it, it does, even though it's a little bit different than friendships, it reminds me of the story where the friends were kind of drifting apart. Mm -hmm. And I like the thought of just like stopping this, vicious cycle that's happening that's mm -hmm. what it sounds like to me it's a yeah. cycle and it just she keeps, said she said it keeps snowballing and getting worse and mm -hmm. then they bring in the family and then which really i think most times ends up just driving people apart right but if you go it's in and drama. say nobody wants the drama yeah but if you're like i'm gonna stop this snowball i'm gonna stop this bad cycle it's interesting to me it's like I, I think people don't naturally go to that. It more is like, all right, no, screw you, screw you. All right. Like it just keeps getting worse. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you just try and say, hey, what's the deal? And maybe that conversation leads to drifting apart, but at least you're not doing it in this weird petty, mm -hmm. uh, what's the term? What's the Midwest thing? Immature? No. Um, passive aggressive? Yes. Passive aggressive way where you're kind of going around and talk like bringing the family into it it's just getting that's just so annoying the whole thing's annoying it's traumatic you know i had a cousin and morgan you never even i know that you know you the story of my cousin but uh we grew up together we were together all the time we were as kids we learned to scuba dive together we did this together we traveled around the country my parent our parents sent us around the country together we were like brothers and as we hit maturity and I started working and he worked or went to school and we drifted. And the next thing I know is he got into gambling, he got into alcohol and drugs and, you know, and we were disconnected, which really made me, and I tried to connect with him, but he had his own little thing. And I don't know if it was jealousy with what I was doing at the time. I don't know if, if his jealousy was not jealousy. I just became a prick to him. Maybe I just got too big for my britches. I have no idea. But I just, the bottom line is, is we drifted. And then eventually he drank himself to death and he died of an overdose at a very young age. And I got that word back, not even knowing where he was and about this happening. And it's, I think, I still think of him every day because he was we were close. Don't, yeah. don't let it get to that. Don't let it get to the part where your cousins are gone and you've drifted apart, stop it now. Or at least try to. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm I'm we had an episode um we recorded tonight with a therapist and the circle analogy is like kind of coming to me right now. And I'm just like, it's really cool how she explains it. So if you don't listen to two hot takes, you'll have to go over there and hear this one when it comes out with um so my mom's a therapist. 
But she basically says like, we have these circles and we have our closest, dearest people that know all of our secrets in the first circle. And we might only have room for like one or two of those. And then we go out a circle and they're friends that we're close with, but they don't know all of our secrets. And in that circle, we might have room for five. And you go out another circle. Mm -hmm. And then that circle is people that you say hi to, you're kind of friends with, but not on the closest level with. But in that circle, you might have room for 15 of those people. Mm -hmm. And so I look at this and I'm like, yeah, you are family. You run into each other constantly at family events by the sounds of this. So definitely patch things up. Have the conversation, like you guys are saying. Get to the root cause and hash it out so there's no more talking behind each other's backs or drama. Just be neutral. You can be neutral. Mm -hmm. And if they don't want to be as close as you want to be with them, like that's kind of a tough reality, but you can still be on good terms. And then they're just in one of those further out circles. Mm -hmm. And maybe you do reach out from time to time and say, hey, you guys want to go out when you're free or whatever. But then you're not feeling so bad that things right. are that were left off on bad terms. You're just neutral slash on a more positive note. It kind of reminds me when like in college you'd be on this on every day you're always hanging with the boys. You're always with the boys. It's like boys over everything. You know what I mean? And then the boys start getting girlfriends and they start <laughs> like everything changes. The dynamic changes mm -hmm. and the ones that are left are kind of like, all right, screw you. We're going to keep doing like boys all the time. And so life will take you on different paths. And so I don't know. She's asking if it's her fault. And I, I, I think the conversation you alluded to will maybe be able to see who's fault each piece of it was and maybe or, she did something she didn't realize or whose fault that they that what they feel who is at fault right either but, way there, there there most probably something will positive come out of it one way or the other at least you'll know where you are even if they tell you yeah. we're not interested you'll know exactly where right. you clearly where you stand <laughs> and you can deal with you can deal with that appropriately you can yeah. make your, your your direction change or your um your tact if you're a sailor at yeah. that point in time. Yeah. Well, and hopefully at that point it stops the drama too, yeah. because I mean, it sounds like they're making up. Well, it's childish. They're, yeah. And they're, they're, they're struggling with stuff. I think the comment like, oh, you got, congratulations, you got everything we've wanted. Right. And so then to then lie about, oh, we wished them a happy birthday and they didn't reply, which wasn't even true. So they're, they are dealing with some deep insecurity or jealousy or whatever mm -hmm. that looks like. But at least if you do have a conversation, you can hopefully put a kibosh and stop all Absolutely. of that. Absolutely. And then nip it in the butt. Nip it in the butt. And then they have nothing left that they can say. There's no more ammo. You've mm -hmm. been, you were the bigger person. You apologized and, and you'll the feel rest, better for it. The rest is on them. And yeah, and well, and it is sad because the ideal outcome is leave it all behind and just make up. But also, I know it'll be hard to just let it go after that long. So it's the middle ground. It's the have the conversation. So you're not necessarily leaving it all behind. You're going to work it out, figure it out, and then see what's up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Passing it off. Oh, my goodness You gracious. get to read. Okay. My dad moved from Boston to Norway when I was five. As long as I can remember, he has lived in a different country. He got remarried, had two boys, and started a new life there, all while my mom, sister, and I made do back in the U.S. We used to have a really great relationship. We would talk on the phone at least once a day, usually twice. I would visit in December, and he would bring his family to Boston in July. Fast forward to the present day, and I've been blocked on everything. How did it get to this? I truly don't know where it fell through the cracks. His new wife is the definition of evil stepmom. She is the absolute most toxic person to walk this planet. I've blocked out most of the horrible things she said and done to me because that is just how I deal with trauma. Some of the many things are she told me I was the reason they would get divorced. She would block me on social media just to see how long it would take for me to notice and then cry about it because she said I didn't care about her. She would speak her native language in front of me, saying horrible things about me. I didn't know what she was fully saying. Those are just the very, very tip of the iceberg. If I kept going, we'd be here for days. I know my dad isn't perfect, but his wife has a horrible, toxic, controlling influence over him. In June, he told me 
he wasn't going to make it home that summer because of the travel restrictions. I called BS on that because I'd traveled out of the country and there wasn't much of an issue, just extra testing. Anyway, fast forward to July, the month I would always look forward to and literally count down the days till he came. I was on vacation out of the state and I saw a picture on social media that they were all in Boston. They showed up and tried to hide it from me. I was so hurt it nearly ruined my vacation. It was a horribly toxic summer to say the least. End of July comes around and it's my graduation day. I hadn't heard from my dad in a few days, but I was holding out hope he would show up. The night came and went and he didn't even send me as little as a text to congratulate me. That said a lot and made a statement. I sat back and waited for him to reach out. Radio silence. I was done putting in all the effort if he wasn't going to reciprocate it back. For God's sake, I'm the child at the end of the day. The last I talked to him was July. Skip a few months to September, one of my brothers moved to Boston to play hockey. He is 15 and was moving in with a... Billet family. With a billet family. No one told me about this. I had to find out through talks of the town. Anyway, I reached out to him and we would get dinner about once a month. Until one day I tried to send him a Snapchat and it said pending. I looked at my other brother's status, also said pending. My dad's username, yep, also pending. I checked Instagram, none of their accounts even came up. I was blocked, I checked Facebook, none of their accounts came up. This was all two days before my birthday. All day on my birthday, I waited for something, anything from my dad to wish me a happy birthday. My damn gyno sent me an email to wish me a happy birthday, but my own dad couldn't. So, I haven't talked to my dad in months. Oh, and by the way, whole family is moving back to Boston sometime in the next three months. Do I write him a letter? Do I leave it and see what he does? He is the parent in the situation, and I've tried reaching out. Slash... All of his tires when he moves back. Egg his fucking house. I hate him. Okay. So. <laughs> let, let me, oh, my God. First of all, how old is she? I'm not sure. Well, she just she graduated. graduated high school or college. Bottom line is, is that they're, they're, the question is, is that obviously I believe that this woman, that the, the, the second, the, the stepmother, the evil stepmother is giving a lot of pressure to the father and, and the, the brothers too and Ugh. and is making life miserable for everybody if, if the end is going is going to and is threatening death to the world atom bomb destruction if anyone breaks that silence probably so, and it's unfortunate because she does need her father she's very clear about that so but it it when I got confused about it, I mean, she talked to her dad a few days before. Yeah. It's a, I haven't talked to my dad in months. So, so I mean, this is, this has been going on for you know, about a year. And I guess all she, it's sad, but she can keep trying to make, uh, to, to break the wall to get through to him or wait till he does get back to Boston and show up on his face and say, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. You almost need to do that. Like, I think in my head, I'm wondering, I'm like, did the stepmom go on his phone and block all this on? This is, the, it's but just you would crazy. notice on a birthday. Yeah. When you I tried mean, to contact someone. Well, no, he knows like, what's going on. Yeah. yeah. There, there's no doubt that the mother, the, that the stepmother sick. is controlling. Remember, he's got, he's got kids with this woman. It's, it's a whole other life. This is, in far as she's, you know, we, it's our marriage. You, you can't go against our marriage. I'm going to divorce you if you do this. He's got his, all, his own pressure. Now, some guys would say, fuck you and go get divorced. I'm going to talk to my daughter. Yeah. Right. No one's coming between my daughter. Uh, I understand that because I've had evil women in my life that try to get rid of my kids. And I said, fuck you. Right. <laughs> it, it, wasn't any, it wasn't a difficult decision. Yeah. So... That's I, I, I feel that's going on here. There's a lot of manipulation. Absolutely. And he is too much of a pussy to go stand up to even make contact with her to say, I got all this shit going on, honey, and I love you, but I'm just trying to, you know, get through my marriage with my boys and whatever else, so forth. Yeah. So 
it, it it's a shitty place. So I look at it. I'm like, you. I don't think I would send him a letter because he probably won't get he it. Won't get it. So I guess your your thoughts are show up at the doorstep when he moves and wait till he moves here. Last and, ditch effort. And she's going to have to find him, and she's going to have to corner him. And after that, if there's no change then, in his attitude, then then she'll know. And she's just got to tear, tear the cloth, as they say. He's dead to her. I, it's sad because there's something going on that's weird. Mm -hmm. And and the guy, does, guy doesn't guy does invest that kind of you know phone calling and consistency if he doesn't give a shit for all these years. Yeah. So I, I just, I, I don't believe he doesn't care. I believe he's really got his balls in a, in a, in a vice. And evil stepmother is, is, got, is holding the clamp on those, you know, on that vice. <sighs> So, God, I just be, wow. you just got to just you know be optimistic that it obviously this is what it is, and until you know different, take that tact until you know different, and you got to get a hold of him. You got to you're going to have to corner him wherever the, wherever the fuck he is. I just don't get how someone could have such a problem with you talking to your kids. It's they, they're out it's there. It's disgusting. They're out there. It doesn't. They they are out there. There, right. I think it comes from a place of insecurity. I think a, I think a lot of these negative behaviors that people have and act like this, like it's coming from such an insane place of insecurity. Absolutely. If normal people don't behave this way. This is not a normal woman. No. This is a woman that's got some serious fucking problems. It reminds me of the, the women, well, women or men in this case, but when a, a spouse um, is widowed, and they find someone new and that person has this crazy insecurity about someone who's no longer even here. Well, I will say also that the kids even have a problem sometimes when the parent finds somebody else. Yeah. That they don't want that. God sometimes, for, but I think, yeah. Just this is crazy. So, this almost is to the point, I'm sorry, you can go. I was going to say it almost like, this is so dark to the point I was going to say it reminds me of lions. And when a new male lion overtakes a pride, he will kill all of the cubs that were sired from the past lion. Really? Yeah. It's it's terrible. I never heard that. Yeah. The new lion that comes in will not have any cubs that were sired by that past one. So he kills all the cubs. And that's what this reminds me of. But like, there's a difference between a human and a lion. And this bitch is acting like a lion, like taking out his relationship with his his other kids. It's so toxic. And going so far as to make her sons block their half-sister on Snapchat. It sounded like she was working on a relationship with her brothers mm -hmm. and then just stripped from her because this crazy fucking see you next Tuesday is so insecure. This is the, this is what it is. Well, it's almost like moving from Boston to Norway. It's almost like he left his old life completely behind and just started new as if well, it he didn't did. exist. Yeah. Except, except that he did keep contact with his kids. All right. So what do you think about this? I talked to my dad briefly in December and I told him this was my Hail Mary. I couldn't put up with the ups and downs and the toxic roller coaster he and his wife were putting me through. When he hung up, he said we would talk soon, but his wife wouldn't know about it a recurring theme. Nine times out of 10, wife couldn't know when we were talking. That's why we communicated through Snapchat because it disappears. It was ridiculous, but I wanted to be wanted and loved by my dad so much that I did anything and put up with everything just to get the bare minimum. Anyway, we hung up and I haven't talked to my dad since. I know this is so scattered all over the place. I hope it makes sense. I just need some outside thoughts on this. Well, the outside thought is simply is your dad's a pussy. Yeah. And that's on him. Like this has nothing to do with you. Mm -mm. You are enough. Like his shitty behavior is his shitty behavior and him enabling this crazy, toxic bitch of a person. And so I think like it's talked about a lot in the LGBTQ plus community where your chosen family can be just as valid and just as important as your birth family. And so for, for you, you have your mom, your sister, and you can try, you know, confronting your dad one more time, 
but like kind of you already did give the Hail Mary. Like you gave a last ditch effort and then it still and her maybe, heart her heart is still broken, Morgan. I mean I know it's I mean if I quit talking so to you terrible. because some woman came into my life and I would say, gee, I can't talk to you because I gotta I gotta hide you, what would you think? I would think you are Maybe having the most crushing s- thing ever. Yeah, and I, it's almost like a Stockholm syndrome where you're just like you're bonded to your abuser. Like it's it's a trauma bond, and so. But with all that understanding, how would you still feel? I know she's crushed. She's there crushed. There is no no doubt in my mind. This is gut wrenching, identity crisis causing, world ruining depression inducing this is gut-wrenching this is terrible that's why i'm so mad for her i just want to go and slash this bitch's car tires like when she moves to boston drop me a pin i will be there (laughs) i will drive you i will egg the house after he's a dick like i'm so sad for her over this because this is so unacceptable of a parent to do yeah so when she had this conversation in december did they did they discuss this any further on, on how to deal with it? That's all we got. He said, "I will talk soon." But, but she wife can't, can't know. know about it. So you're gonna, so, yeah. Maybe that's one of his reasons he's coming back, so he can sneak. He he can figure out how to get yeah have a relationship with you. I'm sure, and I'm not trying to be pessimistic here, but. By the sounds of it, if the brother moved to Boston for hockey at the age of 15 and is living with a billet family, he's really good. Like, really, really good. You I, don't, don't, I don't know what a billet family is. A billet family is essentially like, like a caregiver family. So if you are playing for like a development team, like there's mm-hmm. the U.S. development team that you can play for, like depending on what age you are and how like good you are. It's a host family. It's a host, host family. Thank you. Yeah, it's a fancy word for host family. So he's really good. So I'm sure they want to move back to be close to go see his games and support the little golden children, her children. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard that they're in the same city. And I don't don't want to be negative because I do, I really, really hope this turns around when he gets here and he wakes up and it's better. But the brother still is in Boston. Yeah. And she knows where the brother is. I mean, I'm sure if he's that good, all you have to do is Google his name and hockey and it would come up. Right. So she can go find her brother and have a discussion with him and yeah. say, really, can you help me with insight what's going on here? He's probably brainwashed too. Yeah. And he's 15. I don't know how appropriate that would be for a 15 year old. If he was 18 and a little older and his own person and removed from mom and dad a little bit, I would say yes. But 15 is, he's brainwashed, I'm sure. Yeah. And so I think, I don't want to say give up because you need to come to that kind of in your own heart, in your own head. I'd say one more shot when he's in town. And and then from that point forward, he'll have regrets. He will, he will, this will fester. This is not something that. I mean, you can go to him and say, this, this is what's going to happen. Are you okay with it? Are you okay with the fact that I'm out of your life? That you will not walk me down the aisle, that you will not meet my kids, right? That you will not know my partner, that you will not. I mean, there's he's he is really damaging our relationship, mm-hmm. her. I mean, it's it's really sad, but this has nothing to do with you and everything to do with him. I'm so sorry to hear this, but uh, I hope that you will write us and let us know how things are going for you. Yeah. Yeah. Let me know if you want a, a ride. I haven't been to Boston. I'm ready. Oh, I love Boston. Yeah. You can go to the JFK Museum. Maybe we could just Library. like corner them and you, I'll punch real quick and then you punch and then I just, don't punch. I, I, I try you to. You can punch him with words. I, I have a different What is way. wrong with you, you piece of shit? That's not going to work. He's hypnotized. Yeah. So um, Maybe you'll get lucky and they'll get divorced. That's it for 24. Okay. Uh, So we're wrapping it up. Heading over to Patreon. Sorry about last week missing the show, but uh, we're going to make sure we have plenty in the the stack for uh, the next few weeks. I know I'm going to be traveling for two weeks. So, but there will be shows and come check us on Patreon. Follow, Follow us there.
Yeah. So have a great uh, week and thanks for watching and we'll be back on number 25. Bye. Bye. Bye.